And he said, Chris, you've learned things. So what did you learn in design school? Give me an assignment. Have me do some research. And I'm good at research. I want to learn more. So I said to Ben, look up Alexander Rochenko. It's really interesting because when you're self-taught, the, the hardest thing is putting together a curriculum for yourself. Mm. So if I didn't know this specific name, I would have never found this person. You know what I mean? And, and that's the beauty of this exercise is that like, you know, we're bringing the, the curriculum to the self-taught. Just a disclaimer first, you know, this is all stuff that I've, that I've researched. Uh, most of it comes through the internet. So if I get something wrong, let me know in the comments. Yeah, let them have it. Yeah, and um, Chris, this is totally a conversation, so feel free to chime in. You're not going to throw me off by interrupting. Okay. All right, so Alexander Rachenko. Um, he was born in 1891 in Russia, and he died in 1956, also in Russia. He was a painter, a graphic designer, a sculptor, um, and he was basically self-taught in the beginning. He taught himself how to paint um, by using art magazines. Then he pursued five years of professional training as a designer and an artist, both at school and um, kind of apprenticeships. So this is one of his early works. It's, it's called Dance and Objectless Com Composition in 1915. And uh, the reason why I wanted to show this is because it was at this point that he went to school. So 1915 was when he, you know, started his formal education. And at that moment, um, he basically started to change the way he approached art. And you can see that in one of his next works. So this is 1920. So this is where we start to um, bring about his uh, transformation into constructivism. Am I saying that right? Constructivism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very, very simple, bold shapes and lines and stuff like that. And you can kind of see the, the final transformation in his fine art with this pure red color, pure yellow color, pure blue color piece of work that he dubbed the end of painting in 1921. And so these three monochromatic squares, he basically claimed that he had reduced painting to its core. And this was his expression of that. So at this point, he began to embrace design over painting, and he rejected artwork as something precious and unique, and uh, he embraced the idea of artists and designers as engineers um, over aesthetic. Uh, how do you say that, Chris? Aesthetes? Aesthete. Aesthetes. Aesthetes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So somebody that values aesthetics. Um, and he wanted artists and um, designers to basically contribute to the social good and purpose instead of being commenters on it. So his work is really uh, kind of intertwined with politics. He's also known as a father of constructivism. We talked about this a little bit, and this piece is called Spatial Construction Number 12. This is in 1920, and you can see that it's a piece of plywood that he's cut into concentric circles and basically allowed the material to dictate the form and the shape of this piece. Chris, can we go to you? What do you think about this piece? Uh, this was that a, this piece here? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm not that familiar with his fine art or if this is photography or a sculpture. What am I looking at here, Ben? It's basically his comment on the planetary orbits, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically wanted to make... Oh, so this is a mobile? Yeah, it, it's kind of suspended mm. in air. All right, so the constructivist movement um, basically used clean lines, primitive shapes, flat colors, and the, just the complete absence of frivolous embellishments. Mm. Kind of neat. Well, I'm glad you did this for historical context so you guys get a broader picture of who Alexander Rochenko is. And for me, he's the father of constructivism and the beginning of graphic design as we know it today. And you're going to see in the ongoing series how we're going to connect this all the way from the 1920s to Aaron Draplin today. And you're going to see this thread. So let's go to his graphic design work where we can get our audience super excited. So yeah. let's take a look at some of his iconic work here. And a lot of people are saying he's a, he's a poster artist. And it's really, I don't want to put him in that label. He's just a graphic designer in this instance. And he is heavily influential. And we're going to be able to, to thread that for you guys in a series. So keep going, Ben. Yeah, so what was interesting to me was to see that that kind of 
final or finite uh, switch from fine art into design and, and basically visual engineering that we have here. Um, so this is a this is a poster that he that he did for. Uh, it's called Better Pacifiers, and uh, it kind of embodies his switch from aesthetics into purpose, because this was one of the first times that modern design and modern aesthetics were brought into Russian advertising, which now you is guys, pretty neat. Remember, this is in the 20s, turn of the century here. This is pre-Macintosh, pre-Photoshop. All this stuff was done by hand. I'm going to get rid of these grids. Please. It's bothering me. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was part of your design. No, I, I, no. I knew that there's something was funny. I was like, ugh. Okay, All there right. we go. It's nice and clean now. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's keep going here. All right, so this, this is my favorite. Oh, oh, this so good. is just man. Wait, can we talk about what those posters were meant to do? Well, this was an advertisement for what? For what? Pacifiers. pacifiers. So you can see there's like oh. there's eight pacifiers around this or nine around this baby's mouth. Um, I thought they were bullets. Me or, too. Or yeah, like grenade things or something. Well, yeah, you guys, we're we're not experts in Russian constructivism and graphic design. I I like to keep us on the area of safe and talking about what we know versus what we not what we don't know. Right. Because some historian will come in here and tear us apart. So I just want you guys to be familiar with this work and then dive in deeper. And now you're going to see something here. Now, as you're looking at this work, think in your mind, is there an artist we've seen or people who've done work like this? And let's just keep it going, okay? Yes. We can't dive too deep because we're safe on the surface. When we go too deep, we're going to get ourselves into trouble. Yeah. All yeah. Right, let's keep going. I think it's also safe to talk about the typography here. How it's just like, I mean, it's super square. Um it's it's very geometric. It's it's solid, um, and it it basically kind of props up the rest of the design. All right, let's get into this next piece because this is my favorite out of all of the stuff that he's done. This is called books, and this was a political poster. So, um, as Rodchenko moved into the 1920s, he began to get really involved with the Communist Party there. Um, I think it was the Bolsheviks. I'm not really sure on that. That but, sounds about right. Um, basically. This was uh, kind of a propaganda poster. And, and this is what we were talking about earlier, this, this black, red, and white thing. And, and this, this poster was um, to drive the, the creation and the acceptance of books. In, I, so it says on the right something to the effect of in all branches. I don't know whether that means government or wh what that means, but it's, it's a political-driven poster. Mm. The cool thing about this is it's like the montage of photograph with... Um, you know, solid shapes. Chris, earlier you told me it was from a specific movement. I'm drawing a blank there. Yeah, I think this is a collage. Mm -hmm. And so, it's the first female cinematographer, according to Eric Romero. And someone said this is where Shepard Fairey got his game from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was waiting yeah. for it. I know. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. So when we talk about originality, this is a dangerous topic. I don't want to start it today because I don't want to set a fire storm going on right now because there's lots of conversations about originality. You think the work is original and fresh. All you have to do is keep retracing things back and you're going to get to the source. At one point it was original, but now everything comes from something, right? This mm -hmm. is at the beginning of graphic design, so everything that was done was original, whether it was good or bad or not. But I love well, even the even the collage technique was from the Dada, right? Yeah, Dadaism. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that. But I love the asymmetry. Whereas the other piece, I guess, is symmetrical too. It's just on its side. There's heavy symmetry in these compositions, and it's hard to pull off symmetrical layouts and make it look fresh and modern. Right. And typically, when you see a centered layout, it's very old-fashioned looking. But I love the shape, how the word coming out of her mouth gets bigger as if it's uh, a comic book dialogue thing going on. And those lines Mega continue phone. out and bounce back. Yeah, It's really beautiful. Amazing design. I am pretty sure if you broke this down into a grid, there's probably some crazy golden means situation going on here. Because a lot of <laughs> painters back in the day, when they're painting three squares on a, on a page, or on a canvas, they were using those kind of rules with the grid. This is a series of magazine covers that he did. Beautiful. Um, online, uh, you can you guys can find all this stuff uh, on the Museum of Modern Art website. There were like 40 of these, and they were all very similar. Um, they all had different uh, collages in that center part, um, but every single one had a different color. And I just like the consistency, the chunkiness of the, you know, as Draplin says, thick lines. It's just awesome. It's untitled. I think it was just uh, a cover of a magazine or perhaps an advertisement. Um, so there's no title on, on a couple of these. But 
I just love the use of space here, and it's just so simple and, again, just chunky. Um, those bold shapes. It's awesome. Oh, thick lines, Ben. Thick, thick lines, lines, man. Mm. Mm-hmm. Keep going. This is a very iconic piece. Yes. So I found this about like 10 minutes ago, so I don't know much about this. Chris, can you speak to this? I, I, I love the, the way it looks. I, I can't, but it's 2017. This work was done in the 20s. Right. So this is something close to 100 years old. Look how fresh this looks. And it's still good. Why is it still so good, you guys? You did work Timeless. two weeks ago, and it's already dated looking. <laughs> Seriously. It's true. Right? And so, Ben, you and I got into this, this discussion. It almost turned bad, but luckily I, I, I didn't go there. But you said, Chris, this is so on trend. And I looked at you like, that's not a compelling yeah. argument for you, Ben. <laughs> Please, never say to me this is on trend because I'll, I'll just destroy it. I, tr- I strive to create design that is timeless. Things that don't follow trends but are based and rooted in strong design principles. That's not to say that you you should ignore what's happening in society and culture or there's different interfaces that are being used. That's okay, but grounded in solid design fundamentals. Don't chase a font that was cool because you know what happens when it's not cool anymore? Your work is not cool. And you'll feel bad. You know that shame that Molly was talking about before? When you jump on the flavor of the month design trick, graphic, or texture? Ugh. You're going to regret it later. You remember that game before when we were saying, look at the, look at the design. If you use really basic shapes, mm-hmm. geometric things, a square, a circle, a triangle, you're, you're off to a good start. And you can see all three shapes here. Look how the eye is drawn in. If you follow the exclamation point down to the, uh, everything's flipped backwards for me. Follow that around. It hooks up to the top and it points right at the airplane. This is super dynamic composition. The shapes are designed to draw your eye in. Masters of composition, whether it's painting or not, or photography, do the same kinds of tricks where they bend the elbow a certain way and the finger points to the bowl and the bowl kind of push, puts you back into the frame. Mm-hmm. If you study comic book art, the ones that design panels really well, they do this as well. So for sure, we're going to get into comic book artists, different graphic designers, photographers. This is going to be rich content for you guys. Now look at the topography here. Essentially, I can't really tell, but it looks like it's one or two typefaces. It's bold, and it it follows the rule of contrast where you can see the airplane shape, the big block of red color, simple shapes, no gradations, no stippling, no cross-hatching because they know how to make an image read. I like the repetition, too. Super simple, guys. The shapes of the type fit the rest of the shapes on the page. You know what I mean? Yes. Here's another logo, and he did a lot of work for... um, aviation or or airplanes but a lot of it is untitled or uncredited i just loved the symmetry um the the use of of shape here it's unique and to be honest like i have seen this in other places ripped off so i know that this is kind of like out there but i just i love this i love i think he does it best (laughs) well Guys, what are we looking at? We're talking about basically two circles, the outer circle, the inner circle. I guess there's three circles and the propeller part that connects it. And it's split. It's still somewhat symmetrical. And it's a beautiful way to do this. Red, black, and there's enough of a gap between things so that everything separates and read nicely, whether you scale it up or down. Mm. Um, And I'm not saying this as trying to call something out, but the BMW logo is quite like this. Oh. Right? Because the BMW logo is also an abstract representation of propeller blades. In the 1930s, Rachenko fell out of favor with the Communist Party. And so a lot of the aesthetics that he had created became outlawed. They were literally outlawed. They were illegal. So what he did was he shifted his focus to photojournalists and uh, back to painting. The last slide I have is one of the best... Um, photos that that i've seen it's called steps it was done in 1930 um he took photos at these weird like really strange angles um that just gave the shape the the shapes that were created by the the light and the shadows it just gave them a a different look that um we probably hadn't seen before his Mm -hmm. time and the what i really like about this is that we've got this repeating kind of strong uh, geometric shape that goes diagonally across the, 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 the frame. And it's contrasted by a mother and child who are rounded, they're softer, they're gentler. I just, I was blown away when I saw this. It's a beautiful photograph. Yeah, I'm not familiar is. with this piece. 
myself, but I love the lines. And when we talk about Lester Beale and his poster art and his graphic design, American designer, you're going to see the repetition of those forms, and he'll use red, white stripes to speak about America and patriotism. And anytime you have repeating patterns like this, your eye is able to both appreciate the pattern and the silhouette that's popping out. So here's this poster. This is something that you uh, you, you called out to me. Um, Ooh. Ooh. I, I'm going to let you take this because I am i don't know too much about this one. Okay, the image on the left, I assume, is the original poster yeah, from Yeah, that's Lachenko. the original. And, and then <laughs> there's some funny the things going on. First of all, I don't know who this woman is, but she's got an amazing gaze upon us. She's looking right direct at us. Her eyes intense. are wide open. It's super intense. Yeah. And I love how her shoulder and neck are cut out. It almost looks like an eye eyeball or an eye shape itself. Mm. And so there's this thing about eyes and repetition and forms. I don't love the type on top where it's reversed out. It That's what he wound up doing. And who am I to criticize that? And then on the other side of this is the red car logo, which is a literal rip off of this thing. <laughs> and that's okay. That's an editorial company. And I'm not here to point fingers and say, that's not original. You knocked us off. But just to point out to you how much of our visual vocabulary is borrowed from the past. So our thing is to put our own spin on it, to do our own interpretation of it, and put two things together. Make it your own. Look, you guys, you guys know where I stand on this whole idea of originality. I put out a tweet this morning that says, if you think your work is original, it suggests that you're either ignorant or arrogant. You're ignorant because you don't know the history, Ooh. and you're arrogant because you think it was all you who did it. If we can just let go of trying to be original and just focus on trying to be good, I think it's a much healthier place for all of us to operate out of it. So now we're going to do this series and you're going to just going to learn and see where everything comes from and realize it's futile. I guess it's thematic here. The Russian constructivism, there's a political movement attached to it. Yeah. We're trying to create a movement here with what we're doing. We're trying to teach you the things that I learned in school and Ben's going to help us do that by doing all the hard work and he's going to learn and you guys are the beneficiaries of that as well.